Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> Number nine. Share your journey. Peddling ice to Inuits? Selling seawater to a dolphin? Compelling consumers to wear cotton? Today, the last of those doesn't seem like a sketch, a stretch. Examine the threads of every clothing item you own, and chances are many, if not most, of those are cotton. But in the 1970s, that was probably not the case. Polyester and its synthetic cousins were the rage. They didn't wrinkle, they, didn't, they resisted stains, and they were form-fitting. And as a result, cotton's market have d shared dwindled to about 33%. The industry decided to fight back. It needed to make cotton desirable again. So it did what any industry would do. It started, it started a trade association, hired ad firms, and rebranded cotton. The slogan they settled on to save their industry? Cotton, the fabric of our lives. They had celebrities pitch the slogan. Barbara Walters famously donated, donned a Hawaiian shirt Looked into, the car, looked into the camera and said, Cotton, it's making my life comfortable today. When the cotton industry was on the line, its members made a strategic decision that the best way to get people to buy their threads was by threading cotton into a personal story. Cotton wasn't a soft, white, fluffy fiber that was spun into threads that became fabric, that became garments. Cotton gave life meaning by trying it together, by tying it together into a beautiful story. Today, cotton commands about two thirds of the market. People don't want to be treated as commodities, but more than that, they don't want to see their lives as ordinary. People want to know that they matter, and the best way to show that to show them that they do is by allowing them to connect with a larger story. People and businesses that understand this principle are unbeatable. In 2011, Apple topped Fortune's survey of people of business people as the world's most admired company in the fourth year in a row. Part of the company's secrets is found in one of the most famous TV ads in history. In 1984, during the Super Bowl, Apple unveiled its Macintosh personal computer for the first time. The ad was aimed at distinguishing the radically new and creative and creativity encouraging Mac from the conformity of the, to, of the masses to Apple that was IBM. To the ad, I mean in the ad, an athletic young woman carrying a large hammer runs into a room of look-alike, dress-alike, suede old people. She throws the hammer at a green screen and destroys an Orwellian Big Brother type figure. It was the dawning of a new day. Treating people as mere social security numbers with arms and legs is over. One-on-one -on -one business was the new wave, was the wave of the future. The proof of this concept isn't found just in Apple's success. It is also found in some simple shoes. Blake Mykoski started Tom's shoes after a story disrupted his life. He was traveling in the developing world when he noticed a simple problem. The kids he saw had no shoes. No shoes meant a lot of other no's in their stories. A lot of depreciation. So Blake decided to start a company that would match every pair of shoes purchased with a pair of new shoes for a child in need. The first year, he had the pleasure of giving away 10,000 shoes. Today, that number is over 1 million. But that's not where the story ends. One afternoon in an airport waiting area, Mykoski noticed a girl wearing a red pair of his shoes. Without revealing his identity, he asked about them. The girl told him the whole story behind Tom's in such detail that it rivaled his, his own description of the company. 
It was a moment that made him realize the truth is what's inside this box is not nearly as important as what it represents. Tom is no longer a shoe company. It's a one for one company. In addition to attracting the interest of mainstream media starting with Vogue, Time, and People magazine, Tom Shoes attracted pre prestigious partners, explains power blogger Valeria Maltoni. Ralph Lauren, who had not partnered with anyone for 40 years, joined in with Tom's Shoes for the rugby brand. The ad agent working with AT&T created a commercial to tell the authentic story of how Blake used their network to stay in touch and work on the go. Now, Tony concludes her thoughts on the success of Tom's was an insightful nod to the power of this principle. People remember, and when a message is a mission, they will tell your story to anyone who will hear it, even a stranger at an airport. And by doing that, they become your strongest advocates in marketing your product. The lesson, influence is given. While larger stories can be inviting, the land of small, personal stories can be intimidating. It is one thing to reveal a cause, cure, or a commodity. It's another thing, it's another thing entirely to reveal yourself. In April 2003, Author David Kuo was driving home from a party with his wife. He woke up in the ER, told he had a brain tumor likely to kill him in a matter of months. At 3 o'clock on that Palm Sunday morning, David and his wife Kim faced a decision. How much of the story did they want people to know? How willing were they to share it? The tendency to remain private but they resisted that impulse. And Kim started calling friends, telling them the story and telling them the, to tell others so that they could pray. Within hours, of, within hours, a page for them was set up on caringbridge.org, a nonprofit site where people facing serious illnesses can post updates, needs, and anything else that they would like. In the weeks and months that followed, the Kuos decided that the more information they could share, the more people they could help. They knew that they, hard, they were hardly alone in their cancer battle. That decision was life-changing for them. They saw their story as part of something far larger than them. It eventually provided a type of opportunity for them with other people facing similar challenges. Their first bit of advice for everyone, share your story. That's something Ann M. Baker from Seattle, Washington learned in the Dale Carnegie training course. Most people treasure their privacy, as I do. However, when faced with breast cancer, chemotherapy, and radiation treatments, I did not want to share the worry and the pain. But when my cancer news slipped out among family, friends, and coworkers, I was overwhelmed with email encouragement. Even family acquaintances whom I had never emailed their who I have never met emailed their breast cancer stories, including phone numbers and follow on get well cards. This is amazing this amazing outpouring of courage and love started to really to re started a recovery journey that has changed my life. And thanks to email, I know that no one needs or wants to journey the cancer road alone. For life is not about me, it's about us. There's nothing wrong if something that is about us is also good for me. One di digital media blogger with more than a million followers put out the word that she was going to have lastic surgery to correct her eyesight. Not only was she going to have the surgery, she was going to stream it live on her blog for all who were interested in having the surgery themselves. Transparency became her currency. She not only got 20 out of 15 vision, she got better insight into a whole new way of using the digital world to share our personal journeys with others. She cites the live stream of a friend's recent wedding 
or a client's use of live streaming video to watch his son's football game when he's away on business as good examples. Aside from sports, entertainment, and marketing, what else can live video be used for, she asked. Will it be adopted as a new communication channel used for functional benefit? What about weddings, graduations, club meetings, religious ceremonies, birthdays, coaching, instructional content, cooking classes, birth, or even funerals? The opportunities are endless if they are embraced. People trudge through most days with little excitement in their lives. But our digital age provides so many opportunities to give people an authentic view of who you are or what your company strives to be, thus creating touch points of com commonality that draw you into closer friendship with others. It is easy to make a video instead of presenting a few drawings. It is easy to create a dynamic website to support a new company or organization. It is easy to use video conferencing instead of a call and to show a compelling presentation to all involved instead of simply telling them. But people have come to expect these things too. To really make your idea pop, take a unique approach. Step beyond the bounds of your computer and do something people don't see every day. Use all the tools available to you and your imagination can make your ideas vivid, interesting, and dramatic. Share your stories, and others will be willing to share theirs. Together, you will create a new and larger story. More and more common and commonly effective at building influential relationships is the authentic intersection of personal and professional life. While this intersection will always have certain judicious boundaries, many of the historically business-like boundaries have been lowered or removed altogether today because most people have come to remember that the short and long-term success of all interactions, transactional or otherwise, rides on the depth of the relationship. The more a colleague, friend, or customer shares of your journey, the more you can accomplish together. When your journey is our journey, we are both compelled to see where it goes. Throw down a challenge. When it comes to discussions about the best NBA, NBA history, the best players in NBA history, two names usually come up. Larry and Magic. Larry Bird and Irvin Magic Johnson were individually two of the most compelling players that ever graced the hardwood courts, gifted passers who possessed almost otherworldly senses of players and positions on the basketball court. They were virtually unrivaled in clutch situations. They prided themselves in for their defense as much as for their offense and they worked harder than any of their teammates. And to define basketball for a decade, Magic beat Larry in the 1979 NCAA championship, then beat him again in the 1984 NBA championship. Larry beat Magic in 1985 and then lost to him again in 1987. For most of their careers, they didn't much like each other but their respect for each other knew no bounds. Then, in 1991, Magic was unexpectedly forced to retire from basketball, from professional basketball, because he contracted HIV. The day after Magic's announcement, Bird found himself preparing for a regular season game. He stretched his back, loosened up by jogging through the corridors of the arena, shot baskets from his usual spots on the floor, and for the first time in his life, he had no desire to play. His competitor, who by then had become his friend, had gone, was gone from the sport.
Magic had played a major role in making Bird who he was. A few months later, at his retirement ceremony, Magic said, I want to thank Larry Bird personally for bringing out the best in Magic Johnson because without you, I could have never risen to the top. Some people seem to think that competition is a dirty word. It isn't. Competition is one of the most compelling realities of the natural world. While connection is necessary to keep us thriving, competition is necessary to keep us striving. As iron shapes iron, wrote King Solomon, Israel's third monarch, so one man sharpens another. The sound of iron sharpening iron is about as subtle as the sound of fingernails on a chalkboard. But King Solomon recognized that the only way to get the best out of yourself and others is to challenge and collide. While a life of permanent interpersonal pleasantries appear more comfortable excuse me, and sounds more peaceful, a, rel- a relationality a, re- a relationally complacent, complacent life is a fruitless life. A challenge doesn't have to involve blood, sweat, and tears. Coke issued a challenge to consumers in 2010 social media ad campaign. They challenged people not to smile. Coke set up a special vending machine on a real college campus. This machine didn't just dispense soft drinks. It surprised students with everything from free bottles of Coke to a bouquet of flowers, a pizza, and a six-foot sub. The cameras caught it all, and the results were streamed to YouTube. The sheer joy and surprise of the students receiving the gifts, some high-fiving, others hugging, all smiling and laughing also put smiles on the faces of the nearly 4 million viewers who watched it online. The challenge to, to viewers was not to smile, and it garnered millions of willing failures, just as Coke hoped for. One of the things that, dr- that drove the early, wild days of the internet was the passionate competition between Microsoft and AOL. Easily forgotten in this era of Apple and Google, The AOL Microsoft battle accelerated the availability of cutting edge services for the customer. Each company envisioned the day when consumers would perform the majority of the transactions online, get most of their information online, and live a big chunk of their lives online. The companies loathed each other, and their cultures were vastly different. One was a consumer-oriented marketing company that happened to use technology, and the other was a technology company that happened to use consumer marketing. AOL testified against Microsoft in the antitrust trial against the big, the giant software company, and yet that competition made both companies larger and more successful than either would have been without the other. Yes, everyone faces challenges in their lives, and people commonly say it doesn't matter what the challenge is, what matters is how one responds to it. True enough, some people get injured or sick or hurt and give up. They put themselves on the conveyor belt to the brave. Others rise to great heights. Take Teddy Roosevelt, for example, a sickly child. Young Teddy had a life-threatening asthma. Oftentimes, he struggled to breathe, and the asthma weakened his heart. Then, when he was 12, his his father put down a challenge. Theodore, you have the mind, but you you have not the body. And And without the help of the body, the mind cannot go as far as it should. You must make your body. It's hard druggery. Drudgery to make one's body, but I know you will do it. In response, the boy half grinned and half snarled. The first reported instance of the look that would have known, that would become known the world over. 
He then jerked his head back and replied through clenched teeth, I'll make my body. Over the next year, his life consisted of strenuous exercise, and as his strength grew, so did his boldness and daring. He plunged into icy rivers and climbed seven mountains, including one of them twice in a single day. And as he did these things, his obsession with nature began. Everything from birds to moss fascinated him, and he collected several hundred specimens for preservation in the Roosevelt Museum of Natural History. Without his father's challenge, what might have become of the of such a sickly boy, the challenge changed him forever. It is also true, however, that the challenge itself is just as important as the response to it. Challenges that inspire and compel are very different from challenges that discourage and depress. Facts. In 2010, Sean King, pastor of Courageous Church at Atlanta, wanted to raise money for a permanent home uh, for disabled Haitian orphans. But how to do it? This was the first challenge. In the digital age, creativity in such matters was greatly expanded. He wanted to reach the biggest audience possible with the message. He came up with the idea for a celebrity charity auction with a twist. People wouldn't be bidding for a picture, an autograph, or a date, they'd bid for a celebrity to follow them on Twitter and retweet their posts. He approached Desperate Housewives star Eva Longoria Parker with the challenge. She jumped in and then challenged her celebrity buddies to become part of it as well. They did, and Twitch Change was born. In 2010, more than 175 celebrities with a combined 90 million followers garnered 30 million hits and raised more than $500,000. That's the power of a meaningful challenge in an age where our reach is long and influence is expansive. There are pernicious half-truths in the world, but few are disturbing as get along, go along to get along. That isn't a way to live a life raise a family, or run a business. People don't want to be leveled down. They want to be leveled up. They want their vision raised. And sometimes that means excuse me, throwing down a challenge. Charles Schwab once said, the way to get things done is to stimulate competition. When we compete, we are striving to win because the winning jagger generates a feeling of success and importance. When a victory is defined as team victory for a cause, a country, a cure, or a company, winning is all the more compelling because the competition forces us to communicate and connect in an area of affinity. The competition comes to mean as much for us as its camaraderie, camaraderie, as for its camaraderie, as for its ultimate result. I don't know what that means. Not gonna lie. Um, camaraderie. What does that mean? Camaraderie. Camaraderie. Comradeship. Camaraderie. Good fellowship. All right, I guess. It's so slight. Okay. It means good fellowship, comradeship. All right. The competition comes to mean as much for us for its camaraderies or as for its ultimate result. Look around your sphere of influence for an area of affinity that can generate a competition that can mean something more than reaching a finish line. Something you can mean that something something that can mean lasting friendship and corporate influence for positive change. If it's one person you like to help change, 
throw down a compelling challenge that gets you both involved in the area. Nobody said challenges were clean endeavors. Get dirty for the sake of others, and they will get dirty for you. Aww, so nice, honestly. Part 4. How to lead without resistance or resentment. 1. Begin on a positive note. In his classic book, Leadership is an Art, author Max Dupree famously asserted, the first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. The last is to say thank you. In between, the leader is a servant. A tendency is to take the assertion to mean we must bear down and get the ugly stuff said first. As though it were, the it were to the leader's advantage to get the bad news out of the way. But this is not the case, especially in a day and age when bad news travels at the speed of light. While a current relationship, whether between a company and its customers or between two individuals, might be strained or even in serious trouble, it does little good to start off a conversation on a negative note. Like a play whose first acts features a tragedy, it sets a gloomy and unpleasant stage. Shoulders sag, faces fall, and hearts begin to sink inside the recipients. Imagine this effect spread virus-like throughout the ranks of an organization or across a company's entire value chain or across an entire country. You will be forced to work against a wave of negative psychological and physiological reactions from the start. And even if you can overcome them quickly, there's no need to spend the little time you may have trying to undo something that could have been avoided in the first place. Instead, Begin the conversation with an honest and gen and genuine with honest and genuine appreciation. The receiver will be more amen amenable to your ideas and less defensive or resistance. Many of us have experienced that defensiveness and resistance when dealing with customer service agents. Amazingly enough, but Sanjiv Ekboat who had recently read How to Win Friends and Influence People, knew how to handle a difficult situation. He had recently purchased a house with a home warranty. One evening, the bathroom faucet began to leak. So, he called the warranty company, and within four hours, the young technician arrived to fix the problem. First, he, revived, he replaced the valve but the water began flowing faster. So the technician capped the pipe, but the water pressure broke seals and water began leaking inside the walls. Sanjiv was upset and immediately called the, called the warranty company to ask them to send a more experienced technician. He could have ranted and raved at the person who answered the phone, but instead he paused. He calmly provided his information and then he thanked the representative for sending, for sending out a technician so quickly. He explained what had happened, and the woman tracked down an expert technician, scheduled the earliest appointment possible, and waived the fee. If Sanjiv had reacted differently, would he have received the same service? This seems like a rather simple technique, yet it is deceptively difficult to practice. Let's consider Dupree's mandate for leaders to understand why. At the heart of our misinterpretation of his statement is the co connotation that the term re reality, reality bruh, carries in our daily disclosure. Why is it that we have to face reality, deliver a dose of reality, that is reluctantly, reluctantly swallowed like, full, like foul medicine, be, brings someone back to reality from an idyllic dreamland that doesn't jibe with the hard-nosed facts. This is the mindset 
from which we often approach crucial conversations. In reality, actually, is, reali is reality actually a bitter pill or at least an overly pragmatic one? Probably not, but we may be hardwired to see it that way, particularly when someone is nagging at us. Our hunter gatherer ancestry still dictates that we pay particular attention to the most dramatic unfolding around us, and usually these are negative ones. Our survival depends on this ability, or it once did anyway. Neuroscientists in a variety of studies have shown that we care more about the threat of bad things than we do about the prospect of good things. Our negative brain tripwires are far more sensitive than our positive triggers, wrote Ray, Ray William, a leadership coach. We even remember negative events better, or at least our memories are skewed towards them. Unfortunately, research has shown, has shown that this effect isn't limited to events, but extends to the impressions we form of other people. We may weigh those traits or behaviors we deem to be negative more heavily than the positive, particularly if they are moral or ethical in nature. At those times when we, when we hope most strongly to encourage change in others, we are often frustrated with current conduct. Excuse me. Our brains are preoccupied with the negative behavior. It shapes our perspective of reality. It crowds, out, it crowds out the positive. And so it is no surprise that our communications can't seem to help jumping into the problem or from our listeners' perspectives, the criticism. Our listeners' brains are just like ours. The negative or critical in what we say becomes their point of obsession. It drowns out all possibility of discovering the positive opportunities within the conversation. I'm sure you've seen it happen. Faces grow tight. Expressions become studiously blank, and only the eyes may reveal the inner rant of protest that is blocking out anything else you might have to say. If we don't work hard to avoid this drama, we shoot ourselves. In the leadership foot, in a classic study on how negative and positive feedback affects performance, J. Sidney Schruger and Saul Rosenberg discovered, quite simply, that our performance suffers when we receive feedback that we have failed in some way. Now, if we are confident and have strong self-esteem, the effect is less severe. However, a secondary reaction to criticism is to discount the validity of the, of the feedback. We reject it outright so it has little effect on our behavior except to sully our attitude. Why take the risk? Why not mitigate these effects on performance or attitude right from the start? In an article on leadership skills for teachers, Trent Lor Lorcher explained how, as a basketball coach, he had handled a disappointing loss with his team. We lost an important game on account of several missed free throws. My natural reaction was to yell at my team. Instead, I praised them for being aggressive and getting to their free throw line consistently. We then practiced free throws for the next hour. My players, already upset by the loss, responded well to praise. In his latest book, Good Boss, Bad Boss, Robert Sutton, or an organizational psychologist, relates a, st a story sent to him by a former U.S. Army officer. Most of the man's superior officers were jerks, nasty, belittling, and mean-spirited. But his battalion commander was different. I got out of line a few times, and he brought me in and immediately counseled me on my behavior. He didn't yell or belittle me, and I got the point and was embarrassed that I had let him down. I'm a, better, I'm a better person for it, 
And I like to think that I have picked up his habits and that I emulate his actions by treating people the way they should be treated. We can overcome our baser instincts by acknowledging our inherent tendencies and working to focus our attention on the positive. It is not just positive thinking. It's rewiring our brains to recognize that our perceptions are not necessarily in line with truth. Stopping to analyze our underlying assumptions about a situation and questioning those assumptions until we get to a fuller picture. We can train our mirror neuron systems, those cells discovered in recent decades that enabled us to understand the actions of others, to interpret, to interpret their intentions, and to predict what they might do next, to include positive behaviors and what they reveal about the people we coach. And that is essential if we want to be authentic in our appreciation. We need to find a truthful, positive point to begin form from. And we need to show appreciation that resonates with the receiver. The best bosses, according to Robert Sutton, take the time to discover how each member of their team think and act. It isn't easy. Leaders, despite their best efforts, are often naturally removed from situations that may be most revealing about individual personal dynamics. But making the effort is worth the payout. In terms of influence and effectiveness as a leader, when we acknowledge the value a person has to our organization, we establish a positive tone for open communication. Of course, we must get around to the matter at hand eventually. Perhaps worse than attempting to get the bad news out of the way is attempting to soften it or simply not address it at all. This mum effect, a term coined by psychologists Sidney Rosen and Abraham Tesser in the early 1970s, happens because people want to avoid becoming a target of others' negative emotions. We all have the opportunity to lead change, yet it often requires of us to encourage to, the courage to deliver bad news to our superiors. We don't want to be the innocent messenger who falls before the firing line. When our survival instincts kick in, they can override our courage until the truth of a situation gets watered down into pal pabulum. The mum effect and the resulting filtering can have devastating effects in a steep hierarchy, writes Sutton. What starts out as bad news becomes happier and happier as it travels up the ranks. Because after each boss hears the news from his or her subordinates, he or she makes it sound a bit less bad before passing it up the chain. Leading with the positive and res resisting the urge to promote drama are tools that can help us bolster our resolve, techniques for stepping con confidently into the breach. And leaders who model this behavior are less likely to be blindsided by catastrophes they should have known about all along. At Sonda, Andreas, Andres Navarro found a way to institutionalize this approach by adopting a three-for-one rule. We try to criticize as little as we can. We have a rule. If you get into this company and you find someone whom you don't like and you think doesn't do his work the way he should, don't say anything. Write it down on a piece of paper. People are then required to discover at least three good things about a person before they can open a discussion designed to change the other's behavior. How, then, do we engage the interactions in which undesirable topics must be discussed? We know, intuit intuitively, it is always easier to listen to unpleasant things after we have heard some praise of our good points. If the praise is contrived or if the segue from praise to criticism is too abrupt, 
then this principle will fail. To avoid this, consider the following. First, the praise you offer must be genuine and heartfelt, not just a tool to buy time while you compose your criticisms. Second, you must be able to create a smooth flow from point to point. Third, offer constructive advice rather than criticism following the, the praise. This style of communicating a point can be particularly difficult in written form. Without a natural flow of a conversation that presents opportunities to segue from one topic to the next, it may seem that the other person to the other person that you were just buttering her up. If the topic is particularly contentious, you should really have a face-to-face -face conversation. Many people begin their criticism with sincere praise followed by the word but, which signals that the criticism is about to begin. They may make the listener question the sincere this may make the listener question the sincerity of the praise use and instead use and instead and provide constructive advice rather than criticism. This is possibly the most effective way to address an issue in written form without seeming false in your praise. Beginning the praise with an appreciation will help you help employees to be more productive, vendors be more committed, and friends and family be more inclined to see your point of view. A positive outlook always places interactions on a positive path. Two, acknowledge your baggage. Beth was a high-level executive in a Fortune 100 company. While much loved by her bosses and her team, she was in the throes of battle with the colleague, Harvey, who headed up in another division, who headed up another division, all's fairs, All's fair in love and war, right? Well, Beth was living by that motto, revealing her most vindictive side in her interactions. But Beth wanted to do to be a better leader. So she insisted she enlisted the aid of Marshall Goldsmith, executive coach and author of What Got You Here Won't Get You There. What she learned is that while she may be she was respected by many. Her behavior with Harvey was still affecting her reputation. She needed to negotiate a peace agreement with Harvey. And to do so, she had to admit fault. This might be one of the hardest situations in which to follow this approach. One in which you have to acknowledge your mistakes to the other person whose mistakes have harmed. Tensions on both sides were already high. Competition may be a driving factor. And if you feel it wasn't safe, it isn't safe to make yourself vulnerable. Yet, these are also the situations that can be most effectively diffused by talking about your own mistakes first. So what did Beth say? You know, Harvey, I've got a lot of feedback here, and the first thing I want to say is that I'm positive about a lot of it. The next thing I want to say is that there are some things at which I want to be, I want to be better. I've been disrespectful to you. The company wants to be better. Wait, the company and the tradi traditions of the company, in the company. Please accept my apologies. There is no excuse for this behavior. Harvey's response, he got tears in his eye. He admitted that he too had behaved dishonorably and declared that together they would improve. A lengthy and bitter turf war ended simply by proclaiming the mistakes she had made. It isn't, a, it isn't nearly so difficult to be open to a conversation that may include a discussion of your faults if the other person begins to, by humbly admitting that she too is far too impeccable. Admitting one's mistakes, even when one hadn't corrected them, 
can help convince somebody to change his behavior. Carnegie, the ever-effective communicator, applied this same lesson when writing on it. He began the discussion with a story of how he had failed as a mentor and coach to help readers become open to the idea. It's a subtle and masterly strategy and proof that it can be effective in many forms. The difficulty that leaders face in implementing this strategy rests on one critical element. You must admit that you have made a mistake, that you have made mistakes, that you are failable. Leaders across the globe struggle with this, even though most understand inherently the value of it. And they don't understand it inherently, research certainly supports it. Researchers at, at the Institute for Health and Human Potential conducted a study, a study of 35,000 people on the factors in of the factors in career advancement. The item found to be most linked to career advancement, freely admitting to making mistakes. Admitting you have made a mistake is the first step in in a 12-step program. It is both the hardest and the most important. Until we accept accountability, how can we learn from our mistakes, use them to propel us forward, and encourage others to trust us? To leave the road of continual failure, a person must first utter the three most difficult words to say. I was wrong. He has to open his eyes, admit his mistakes, and accept complete responsibility for his current act wrong actions and attitudes. Portia Nelson poetically describes this process in her autobiography in five short chapters. What begins in many of her first chapters is a pit of despair, progresses only to detachment from the problem until we are able to accept responsibility for our faults. Until we seek until we see the link between where we are and what we do, only then will we begin to see quicker solutions of, to our problems. Only then do we begin to walk around the deep hole of our path altogether. Eventually, we learn we can simply walk down a less problematic path. That is to say, we, remove, we move from merely being proficient problem solvers to be behaving more proficiently. Aside from the personal gains of admitting our mistakes, the trust that builds with our colleagues and customers, our friends and families, and the community members is invaluable. Marshall Goldsmith writes, No one expects us to be right all the time, but when we're wrong, that certainly expects, they certainly expect us to own up to it. In that sense, being wrong is an opportunity an opportunity to show what kind of person and leader we are. How well you own up to your mistakes make, makes a bigger impression than how you revel in your successes. When we talk about our mistakes, it makes us human. It becomes easier for people to relate to us. They feel we understand their perspective better. And in this mental space, they are more open to our advice. What is lovely about this principle is that we all make mistakes and so have an apple ample supply of stories to use when trying to put someone at ease. Remember to follow the story with constructive advice, not straight up criticism. How did Carnegie use the principle with his niece and new assistant Josephine? By considering her lack of experience and his own blunders at her age and experience level. You've made the mistake, a mistake, Josephine, he would begin, but Lord knows it's no worse than m many I have made. Judgment comes only with experience, and you are better than I was at your age. I have been guilty of so many silly things myself, I have very little inclination to criticize you or anyone. But don't you think it would have been wiser if you had done so and so? 
By admitting your own mistakes, you direct the other person's attention away from his own. You soften the approach and avoid raising his defenses immediately. When you acknowledge your baggage, trust builds it naturally. Number three, call out mistakes quietly. During, during the first days of his presidency, Coolidge and his family had not yet left their third floor suite at the Willard Hotel in Washington. In the early morning hours, the president awoke to see a cat burglar going through his clothes, removing a wallet and a watch chain. Coolidge spoke, I wish you wouldn't take that. I don't mean, to, I don't mean the watch and chain, only the charm. Read what is engraved on the back of it. The burglar read, presented to Calvin Coolidge, Speaker of the House by the Massachusetts General Court. Coolidge then identified himself as the president, persuaded the burglar to relinquish the, the watch charm, led him into a quiet conversation, found out that the young man and his college roommates were unable to pay their hotel bill and buy train tickets back to their campus counted out $32 from the wallet, which the dazed young man had also relinquished, declared it, declared it to be a loan, and advised the student that in order to avoid the Secret Service, he should leave an unconventionally, as unconventionally as he entered. Calling, at, at calling attention indirectly to someone's mistakes or missteps works wonders with people who may resent any direct criticism, and that defies most people. Leaders of all kinds have a fantastic tool available to them for sending a subtle message about the behavior they're trying to encourage. They simply have to model th that behavior themselves. Excuse me. And if they do not, the message to those around them will be loud and clear. I tell you I want to behave in such a way, but it's not actually that important. Otherwise, I would do it myself. This concept is John Maxwell's 13th Law of Leadership in his classic The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. He calls it the law of the picture because people do what they see. He tells the story of platoon leader Dick Winters of Easy Company during World War II. Winters believed that it was an officer's responsibility to go first, set an example, lead the charge, and take risks among, alongside his men. One of the most remarkable incidents demonstrating Winters' way of leading by example, occurred after D-Day on the road to Carrington, a town that, e that Easy Company needed to take from the Germans. As the American paratroopers under his command approved the town, approached the town, they, began, they became pinned down by German machine gun fire, huddled in ditches on either side of the road. They wouldn't move forward when ordered to. Yet if they didn't move, they would eventually be cut to pieces. Winters tried rallying with them. He coaxed them. He kicked them. He ran from one ditch to the other as machine gun bullets flew by. Finally, he jumped into the middle of the road, bullets glancing off the ground near him, and shouted to the, at the men to get moving. Everyone got up and moved forward as one, and they helped to take the town. At times, it is impossible to influence others by modeling behavior. At times, it is impossible to influence others by modeling behavior, either because you aren't with the people you are trying to influence or because you actually aren't immersed in what it is they are doing. How do we influence behavior then? The author of Influencer offers some compelling advice for these situations. Identify those in the group, team, family, or community that have the most influence over others and get them to model the behavior you want to promote. Develop a community approach to the behavior by appealing to the broader good. 
Peer pressure goes a long way towards influencing the thoughts and actions of individuals. Make any changes possible to the resources available or the environment to make the new behavior or mindset easy to adopt. At the end of World War II, soldiers were returning from the front lines and re-entering the workforce. In the process, they were displacing the, the woman that had stepped up and f- in the process, they were displacing the woman who had stepped up and filled many positions in their absence. Many women chose to remain in the workforce which created animosity between the sexes in the workplace, but as but also gave rise to new view of the role women could play in the American economy. Restaurants around the country were facing a particular struggle. The returning soldiers were granted positions as cooks. The women who had, who had held those positions were demoted to waitresses, positions of lower pay. The result, an antagonistic, antagonistic relationship between cooks and waitresses in the environment in which corporation is a necessity. Every, everybody suffered, including the, the patrons who often received, who often received late or wrong orders. Employees were quitting and restaurants were losing customers. So the National Restaurant Association enlisted the help of William Foote White, a professor at the University of Chicago, to solve the problem. He observed the activity in a sample of restaurants. Watching the cooks, watching as cooks and waitresses slung insults, ignored each other and behaved vindictively at the expense of the customer. While many consultants might have been tempted to alter this unhealthy social climate by teaching interpersonal skills, conducting team building exercises, or changing the pay system, why took a different approach, explained the authors. In his view, the best way to solve the problem was to change the way employees communicated. Working with a pilot restaurant, White recommended they use a simple meal spindle to place orders with the kitchen. The waitresses would put the orders on the spindle and the cooks would fulfill the orders in whatever way was most efficient. But making sure that those that were placed first were prioritized. The results were immediate. Decreased conflict, decreased customer complaints, and communication and behavior that were more respectful on both sides. Sometimes, the best way to correct behavior is to not openly punish the wrong behavior, but to use the situation as a platform for building self-confidence and deeper connection. Bob Hoover, a famous test pilot and frequent performer at hair shows, was flying back to his home in Los Angeles from an air show in San Diego. At 300 feet in the air, both engines suddenly stopped. A deft maneuvering, by deft maneuvering, he managed to land the plane and save himself and two others on board. But it was badly damaged. Hoover's first act after the emergency landing was to inspect the airplane's fuel. Just as he suspected, the World War II propeller plane had been fueled with jet fuel rather than gasoline. Upon returning to the airport, he asked to see the mechanic who had serviced his plane. The young man was sick with the agony of his mistake. Tears streamed down his face as Hoover approached. He had just caused the loss of a very expensive plane and could have caused the loss of three lives as well. You can imagine Hoover's anger. One could anticipate the tongue lashing that this proud and precise pilot would unleash in such carelessness. But Hoover didn't scold the mechanic. 
he didn't even criticize his gross negligence. Instead, he threw his big arm around the man's shoulder and said, To show you I'm sure that you will never do this again, I want you to service my F-51 tomorrow. In life, sometimes mistakes by the are the byproduct of extenuating circumstances. We don't always fail at work because of incompetence. We can fail because our hearts and minds are not engaged due to problems at home or elsewhere. The leader understands that mistakes and failures surface from all corners of life, therefore, and therefore, should be treated as isolated and redeemable instances rather than fatal flaws. In an age where emerging leaders are skeptical of inauthentic leadership tactics, tactics, it is best to confront mistakes honestly while not using them as opportunities for condemnation. To many, passive-aggressive approaches or manipulative encounters with leaders diminish their view of that particular leader and make them cynical about their contribution to the task at hand or even the organization they serve. It is to your advantage to pull people out of their dejected state as quickly as possible. Do so by calling out their mistakes quietly and returning them to a place of confidence and strength. Wow.